So Brad, I made fun of it. I poo-pooed it. I thought the trend was silly. And then this weekend, Brad, I tried pickleball, and I got to tell you, it's super fun, Brad. Pickleball is pickleball, super fun. Pickleball, really? Uh, now, yeah. now th- l- let me ask you this. Dill or sweet? Because that's my <laughs> biggest question on this. I, I I like sliced, and I like, what is it, what, like it's cookie crumble or bread crumble? What do they call that flavor that's like basically all sugar and oh, bread in the pickle? It, uh, well, I, I, you're talking about a whole new pickle experience that, I, that I've ever heard of. You've, you've got cookies and, and bread in your you pickles? Caught, you caught me off guard. I should have had pickle recipes ready. Anyway, pickleball, my wife uh, got us out onto the pickleball court this weekend because uh, she's been playing the last couple weekends and she's like, you gotta try this. It's great. Yeah. And I was like, I, isn't that kind of for old people? And Because, you know, you always see the 65, 70-year-olds talking yeah. about pickleball. And I've I've read all the news stories about pickleball courts taking over America and that it drives neighbors nuts because it's a specific bonk, bonk, bonk sound, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. I tried it and it's great. It is so fun. <laughs> it is so fun. And I, I got a legit good workout and I was laughing the whole time. Oh my I, gosh. You gotta try it. I genuinely want to play with you. Oh. Now, it, 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 where's this going? It, can a pickleball league be far behind? No, oh, yes, it could be very far behind. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, here's what I think it'll be I think I'll play. 10 times a year with my wife probably on weekends but yeah. it's so fun yeah uh, and the it's the kind of game and I was like well how is this possible it was described to me as it's a game that 25 year olds can play with 75 year olds and everyone is similarly not identically yeah. but similarly suited uh, to play pickleball yeah. because it it both is and is not high uh, octane sports, you know right. what I mean? Like, yes, you can dive for the ball uh, like you could in tennis. Right. But you don't have to. It's mostly oh. just like, hey, I've got a beer off the side of the court yeah. and let's let's play some pickleball kind of a I, thing. I remember being 25 years old and if you would have given me a nickel for every time I, I cried out of my window, why, oh, why isn't there a sport I can play with a 75-year-old? <laughs> I used oh to I used to absolutely weep. I picked the worst possible time to drink my coffee right as you were saying that, you bastard. And coffee up the nose is not a pleasant feeling. Um, no, yes, but, but like imagine like grandparents, like if you wanted to play with grandparents or, yeah. or, first of all, it's lovely to see 65, 70 year olds just doing anything physical. So like it's oh, fun yeah. for them. But also, come on, Brad, it could, you could have that. <laughs> it's a 25 year old, I guess. Uh, anyway, I think you should try it. It's kind of fun. I will try it. I will. I will check it out. I, I have friends on Facebook that are really big uh, pickleball fanatics, and I just I never really paid much attention to it. Well, I will say this: don't don't let your first game be with someone that plays pickleball all the time, because oh, yeah. the yeah, well, old yeah, ladies... I've heard about the pickleball sharks. <laughs> well, no, but here's the thing: is that um, we had a, a foursome of older ladies playing next to us, and they were good. And um, we, because we had kids playing with us, the balls would go wild every once in a while and cross over to their court. (sighs) And holy hell, the people that take pickleball seriously. You you do not want to get, like, uh, you know how there's bowling, like, for fun, and then there's bowling serious, uh, to put it in your Midwest terms? And there's bowling etiquette? Yeah, exactly. And so the ball crossing over into their, I don't even know if it's called a court, I'm assuming a court, uh, they kept saying, can you just say ball? Can you just say ball? And I was like, geez, we're having fun on a Sunday, I guess. Uh, so I wouldn't start with a super serious person, but if you've got someone in your life that like, hey, maybe you're going to go for bacon and eggs beforehand, and then yeah. you're going to go for playing some pickleball afterward, I think you could you could have fun with it. Oh, my God. Yeah, and, and, and it's ball. It's not for, like, golf. You've got to say ball. This is going to start to get very confusing. Well, and when a child runs over into the court, you have to say, person on the court. You have to- <laughs> <laughs> they had all sorts of very specific. They had a lot of things. rules. They had a lot of rules. So I don't know that I would recommend playing with a shark, but get yeah. out there, Brad, and try pickleball. I legitimately loved it. And I was prepared to be like, what is this nonsense? Yeah. I legit love it. And on that note, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Pickleball Central Comic Lab, the show about <laughs> making pickles. And making a living from comics and pickles. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of the Webcomics Handbook on Substack and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the documentary Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, 
Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics. And a reminder that if you have not yet joined us over on Patreon for my birthday, we're trying to get to 500. And here's what you're going to get. You're going to get over 300 episodes that you've never heard before called Pro Tips, where we break down in real actionable items uh, ways you can help your cartooning. You're going to get all 300 plus episodes of that. You're going to get access to the Discord server, which is bonkers good. And you're going to, if we get to 500, you're going to get two episodes of Drunk and Drunker Comic Lab exclusively for Patreon pals, which is by far some of the best comic lab we do. Oh, absolutely. We're actually looking forward to getting to 500 because those are the shows where the, where the real good stories that were much too smart to talk about on the show come out (laughs) right all these stories that we probably shouldn't be telling uh come out after we get uh, a couple drinks because a we're a little bit more chatty and b we know that this is only going out to our patreon backers who have our backs and and can keep a good story between uh the the 502 of us and (laughs) we look forward to these shows so much so do join us over at patreon.com slash comic club. And Brad, I will start us in on our first question coming in from Patreon from Adam. And Adam writes, good day, Brad and Dave. Oh, good day. He must oh. be from Alabama, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, so uh, Adam writes in, good day, Brad and Dave. I'm wondering what ratio of your work you consider to be top tier oh. measured against your own work. As a recovering perfectionist, in an effort to actually start producing finished work last year, I fired my internal editor. Oh, that's Ooh. interesting. I'm definitely producing a lot more, but whenever that internal editor resurfaces, they're far from impressed. Do you internally feel as though every strip you post is a banger? 50%, 20%? What do you feel comfortable with? Do you ever post a comic thinking, "Eh, not my best, but it'll do. Uh, And that's coming in from Adam. So Brad, uh, as a person who puts out hit after hit, what's your answer to that? (laughs) I would say that it's about 80-20 like like 20 percent really really solid stuff that i'm i'm very very proud of and i have very much confidence is hitting with with a wide part of my audience i don't think you ever get i don't think you've ever done anything any single piece like a like a page or or a strip that hits with every member of your audience and then picks up a whole bunch of new members i don't think that happens often Uh, but has the best chances of all of that stuff. I'd say 80-20. If I ever really went down and concentrated on it and paid a lot of attention to that kind of thing, I think the truth is probably closer to 90-10. But if you're asking me conversationally, I'd probably say 80-20. Well, it's funny. I so having just put together a book that collected roughly seven years of comics, right? Um, I have a slightly different take on this, but it's largely the same as Brad, which is I think while I'm doing the actual work, like the month that I do it, the weeks that I do it, the year that I do it, mm-hmm. 80 20 is roughly correct. I think yeah. that's that's actually probably smart for, for me as well to say the same thing. But if you pull out a few more years, you know, like if you look at it from an editorial eye of like five years on, yeah. 10 years on, I think 5%, 10% mm-hmm. of my work is the best stuff. You know what I mean? Like when I have more to compare it to and time is more of an editor right. where, where it's a wholly different person looking back at this comic. I'll be honest, 10% might be generous. It might yeah. be 5% is my top tier work. Yeah. And that's, by the way, all of this fits into kind of a greater uh, uh, framework that we're trying to kind of promote on the show. And that is, ironically, uh, what we're seeing is that we can't really judge our own work until we have some distance from it. Right. You can't really see that work in a in a in a cold, objective sense until you're completely out of that mindset and and you've got some distance and that then you can see whether it's 90, 10 or 80, 20. But use that same uh, 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 formula, use that same way that your mind works. And if you were to give yourself a little bit more time in the writing phase, after you've written what you thought was a really good piece to to let that sit for a week and come back to it and look at it with a little bit more objective eyes, you could probably improve that piece. And over time, your percentage is going to be closer to 80, 20 than it is 90, 10. Yeah. By using yeah. that same, uh, 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 that same framework, you could actually 
improve your uh, improve your overall performance if you use that same amount of uh, 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 time to objectively criticize your work before it's done. Right. So what we're saying is you can't tell what your percentage is until you have some time and your percentage would probably be better if you were using time in that initial writing stage. Yeah, yes, I cannot argue with that. That's actually really solid advice. Let me ask you this, Brad, because I, I'm sort of uh, I, I don't know how I will answer the, my own question, but Knowing that the page you're putting up this week or the half page that you're putting up tomorrow, right, yeah. might be in the 80 percent rule. Yeah. And I'm, this is a legit question. How do you live with yourself as a cartoonist? If if that, not, then that's too strong a phrase, but you know what I mean? Like, how do you um, emotionally or professionally approach it when you know that the page that you're putting up tomorrow is most likely in that 80 percent chunk of not being top right. tier? And and since you don't have the distance yet, you can't objectively see that yeah, yet. You can't right? yet see. OK, yeah, yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. two things. And that is, number one, I have done a lot better in recent years. And it shows, I think, when I go back and look at my stuff, uh, I, I think that I've done a lot better in practicing what I preach and letting that page sit and then coming back to it. In fact, I write I now write entire uh, uh, chapter outlines uh, so that I can do exactly that. So sometimes mm. when I'm getting on, onto that uh, actual writing part, it's been several weeks or even a, a couple of months since I wrote that initial part of it, right? And mm -hmm. then when I write the page itself, I try to let that go for a couple of days so I can objectively look at it. So part of it yeah. is I think I'm doing my absolute best possible work when I'm putting it out there because I'm using this system that I'm talking about. And also, I'm also going to tell you this next part <laughs> that that I'm glad you brought it up because I had a note here to bring it up uh, right here in front of my desk. And that is this. You're, let's say Dave Kellett looks at the sum total of all of his comics and he comes up with 80-20. Right. Or, or maybe being, you know, maybe it's 70, 30 or who knows. But let's use 80, 20 as uh, as an example. OK. And he mm -hmm. says all of mm -hmm. these in this pile are my best work. And all of these on this other pile are not top tier work. And he separates them all out. Now, let's take any one member of Dave's audience and ask them to do the same thing. They might oh come God, up yeah. with 80, 20. They might come up with the exact same percentage. But if you go through those comics in the 20 percent pile, you're going to see an entirely different group of comics. Yeah, you're right. And also, just as a side note, I want to welcome the entire family of, of voles that have taken up root in Brad's throat for that last answer. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, I don't know if you heard it happening, but you're like, <laughs> I'm, I'm picking up a lot of as I as we go through this podcast that we do week <laughs> after week for a, however many years we've been doing it. I can tell. I'm picking up a little bit of vocal fry here. I'm going to have to, by the time, by the time we're celebrating our 15th uh, anniversary of this show, I'm just going to be wheezing into the microphone. <laughs> well, I, I, so yes. And also to, to, to riff off of Brad's answer. Yeah. The thing, by the way, the comic that I would discard as being in my 80%, I know this for a fact because I see and talk to these people at Comic-Con. Uh, that is their most loved comic. It yes. is not even like quietly in the 20%. It's in the top 1%. Right. And sometimes uh, that's unknowable. In, in, in like, I'm just as proud of that one at the moment of creation of the, as another one in my personal 20%. And only in time do I come to fall out of love. But maybe for someone else, they they grow in more love with that specific comic yes. in time. Like it has resonance with them, which is great. Uh, I will say this, too, is that um, like Brad, I also find that time with drive specifically, if I write it ahead of time, boy, howdy, is it just uh, it's firing on so much better pistons. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that specifically to Adam as the question asker in this one, I want to applaud you for recognizing that perfectionism was keeping your output down yeah. and saying to yourself consciously, I need to not listen to that perfectionist streak so much and just see what happens 
if I up my output? Because here's what's going to happen, Adam, over the next six to 24 months. You will find that you'll slowly bend back towards allowing that perfectionist editor in. And that's yeah. OK, because ultimately what you want is balance. Right. Mm -hmm. You want to have a consistent output that's a, at a suitable volume, but also of the best possible quality that you can have. And both Brad and I at various points in our lives have said, you know what? I am going to really make an effort in this next six to 12 months to focus on, pff, I don't know, my line art or my coloring or my my dialogue or my pacing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you overdo it a little bit with yep. this or that. And then in time you rebalance, but you rebalance usually at a better and a higher quality level. So what I'm saying is even though you have reined in your internal editor for perfectionism in time, as you create a new pace for yourself, that has a higher output, you will find that it's okay to let the editor back in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it is funny having done this show for a while. We've got, we've got uh, uh, questions that tend to come in and also we see work being posted out in the wild. Uh, uh, we see that the, 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 there's an awful lot of people that fall on one side or the other of, of the same scale. Yes. And it's either yeah. somebody who like Adam dealt with perfectionism issues and they it's got to be perfect it's got to be polished to the most extent right and and we've already said it's it's not good to be on that side of the spectrum then on the other side of the spectrum we see a whole lot of people and like we talked about in the previous show we can see it walking up broad street they're posting their first draft because they feel they need to post quantity high quantities, high quantities, right? And, the, and and so they're posting the first draft of their comic and it's clear that if they would have let that sit and given it another pass, it would have been so much better, right? The trick of doing really good work is finding a middle ground in there to, so that you're not posting a first draft and you're not a perfectionist. You're, you're, you're finding a middle ground. And, and, and I, I think that's, that takes a little bit of experience to know where that is, where that line is for you. I don't think it's, in other words, I don't think it's yeah. easy to do. No, I don't think it's I easy. Think, I agree. And I think only in the doing do you come to yeah. know it, which is why I'm saying I, I congratulate you, Adam, for making the conscious choice to do this, because yeah. it's only in the doing that you'll come to find a new level, a new balance between output and quality. Um, so kudos to you uh, for doing that. So, Dave, I've got another question here coming in from Patreon.com slash Comic Lab, and it goes like this. Comes in from Jay, who says, I'm giving webcomics a shot, and I noticed most people post panel by panel. I've been posting by the page. I do make sure my font is big enough to be read on mobile devices, which I assume is the main thing. But are there other drawbacks of posting per page versus panel? Thanks, guys. By the way, nobody says Cincinnati. <laughs> now we gotta take. We've gotta take. We gotta oh, take a, a moment Let me here. In that for a moment. <laughs> I've been. I've been getting dragged uh, from six ways to Sundays over Cincinnati, and 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 uh, and the most uh, the, the the most vicious uh, uh, thing that I heard actually came in from somebody who lives in Minneapolis, uh, and and so I do have to apologize to my friend from Minneapolis, Minnesota. But it is not. <laughs> it is not Cincinnati. It is, so here's the deal. I actually looked this up, uh, uh, and and somebody on one of my socials mentioned it as well. The Cincinnati thing actually stems from a great sportscaster named Red Barber, who pronounced he, he pronounced it Cincinnati. And by the way, I think he also said uh, 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 Minnesota. Or there was another one uh, uh, that had an I at the end that he turned into an A. Uh, and I guess he he kind of influenced the language an awful lot through that. And that's where I had picked up, I think, through a member of my family that it was supposed to be Cincinnati. Since he died, uh, <laughs> that that effect has gone away. Uh, but yes, I will. I will admit I was uh, I was I, I pulling a red barber there yeah, with Cincinnati. Uh, wait, all of wait, my wait. friends so from Cincinnati. From, so your view of this false pronunciation of Cincinnati yeah. became from a sportscaster from a sportscaster named Red Barber. Yep. <sighs> OK, so. 
Is this the kind of thing where for uh, for about a decade it actually was called Cincinnati because of this one person or my my, uh, uh, my view of it is that that was probably the case? Because I, I, I remember some older people in my life saying, no, no. In fact, the same words I said to you, if you talk to anybody from Cincinnati, they'll tell you it's Cincinnati. Same way, by the way, there's a lot of places that are like that. Nobody in New Nobody in New Orleans says New Orleans. They say New Orleans. Oh, they go New Orleans. New Orleans. Right, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So, yeah. There's a, so it became very easy for me to say, "Oh, well, that must be Cincinnati." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bright-eyed twenty-year-old Brad. Yeah, uh, that is funny though that one person, one yeah. single person, might have gently nudged the trajectory of how you pronounce Cincinnati. I mean, to me, that's a little bit like you know that old myth, and I think it's a myth about how Castilian Spanish got the lisp from mm-hmm. the uh, Ferdinand the Third. Yeah, because you know you say "ci si, por supuesto," you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I love the idea that they they modified the language to make the king feel less <laughs> yeah. like, a, like a lisper. Uh, and so I love the idea that Cincinnati for 10 or 15 years happened to be when Brad lived in the neighborhood uh, <laughs> was pronouncing itself Cincinnati just because this one sportscaster. Yeah. That's so random. All right. Well, now let's get into this question, Brad. Let's right. let's tackle his actual question. So here's the thing. Uh, I, I for today's audience. I think your stronger option, unless it's simply impossible, like for some cases, it, it might not be possible. Uh, twi- you know, for example, any place like Twitter that uh, that limits you to three images, right? Well, unless you've got a three panel comic, that's not going to work for you. But on your website uh, and on any social media that allows it, you should be posting panel by panel for one main reason, and that is actually I'll give you two reasons. The the number one reason that is top of my mind is that many of the younger people that you want to have part of your audience. Uh, and, and by the way, when I say younger, it, it, uh, it's not like teenagers and 20 somethings. We're starting to get into a point that it also includes 30 somethings as well. But the younger part of your audience that you want to uh, become fans of your work, their exposure to comics might have been very well. In fact, more and more increasingly, the chances are their exposure to comics was on something like Webtoons or Tapas that gave them that panel by panel reading experience because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they do Mm -hmm. most of their consumption of comics and other uh, content on a smartphone. So it was, so they expect a panel by panel experience. In other words, if you're not giving them panel by panel experience, they they might a, a number one not consider it a comic. They might not know what to do with it. it it's an mm-hmm. it, it's a foreign and weird process for them. And 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 also number two, <laughs> Dave, I, I'll, I I got admit. So when when I when this question came into Jay, first thing I said, I, I wrote him back through the Comic Lab account, and I said, "Oh, Jay, thanks so much for your question. Hey, by the way, I'd love to read your comic." And Jay must listen to the show because I think he knew I was setting him up because I want to see Jay's comic. I guarantee that font isn't big enough. I guarantee you the font is too small to be read on a smartphone unless unless you really is or alternate alternately brad yeah. that font is so big that when you look at it as page format in print yeah. it's going to look all cattywampus in terms of ratio of font size yep. to comic size you know yeah unless he's doing super but then i've even seen a lot of people do min, a, a very minimal comic and their fonts are still way too small to be read or their lettering is too small to be read on a smartphone uh so so jay was too smart he didn't fall for my trap but i'm telling you jay one of these days I'm going to find you. I'm going to look at your comic and I'm going to tell you that font is pro- I, I, I will eat my hat. <laughs> Actually, I better not yeah, say that because I was pretty confident about Cincinnati, too. <laughs> but <laughs> chances are. So, so I, I so that's one reason I'm going to give you for uh, for doing panel by panels. That's your a lot a bigger and bigger part of your audience probably expects that from you. They probably expect yeah. that from you. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say uh, that uh, and I'm going to say this on a personal level. I was someone who really resisted displaying my comics panel by panel. I both as a cartoonist and this is going to sound a little hoity toity, but as a comics historian, I didn't love the idea of 
uh, comics being displayed by panels. So my friends, Brad Geiger and others like Kevin McShane were mm -hmm. telling me uh, probably a decade ago, Dave, it's a mobile world now. You got to start slicing them up. Yeah. You got to start. And also, I didn't want to do the work. I didn't want to redesign <laughs> my website. I didn't want to do all that sort of stuff. But here's the thing now. Now I have a reactive website that when you're reading on a large enough tablet or on a desktop computer, it gives you the page because yeah. you're reading on a differently sized screen in a different situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can read that whole thing. But when you're on the go, which is a surprisingly large percentage of people yeah. in the U.S., it's I, I'm just going to throw a number out. It's not right. But like 70, 80 percent. If it's certain countries in Korea or Japan, it's like 98 percent. It's ridiculous how many people read uh, consumer content mm -hmm. on their phones. Uh, but it's a huge number is what I'm getting at. Yeah. But. The money is made in the books. Yes. So the only way yeah. to to uh, to split the baby on that is to design the page for the book. Yes. But to slice it up to be read on mobile. And that's the bottom line of it. So if you're doing what you say you're doing, which is I'm making my font big enough so that the page can be read on a mobile phone, I can tell you that when it comes time to put that into a book, which is where the money is, mm -hmm. it's going to look like, hello, I'm reading a comic, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. it's not, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be what you want. Right. right. And, and here's the second reason I'm going to encourage you to consider doing panel by panel and that is that I want you to stop thinking about your uh, updates. And this is something I'm, I've been really thinking about a lot. I want you to stop doing this knee jerk uh, 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 reaction that you post a page for your social media update or post a page on your website. Uh, I want you to start thinking about these as updates and not pages. And that and, and, and what I mean by that is sometimes it might take like a panel from the previous page to bring that person in. Or, or it might might be that you need to post two pages worth of stuff to get a significant update on social media. Right. I, I want you to or, or in my case, I page ha I, I do half a page at a time. The more I can get you to stop knee jerk thinking about posting a page at a time and start thinking about this as posting a uh, satisfying update for your readers, uh, I think the better you're going to do at capturing new readers, because the whole thing is if you're doing it, if you're if you're doing like a lot of people do and they're making the book first and foremost, uh, you, chances are you're missing the opportunities to capture new readers because every day somebody's seeing that for the very, very first time. They're coming in on page 12. If you're pasting pages instead of updates, you may not be capturing that person. Yeah. And I, I have literally nothing better to add to that other than to say uh, best of luck with it, because I, I do think it's something that you need to take a, a second look at in terms of font size to page size ratio or font size to comic size ratio. Yep. Um, and uh, again, Brad has the best final word on that one. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Dave, I filled out my nominations for the annual Rubin Award this week. Did you do the same? I did, Brad. Yes, this is the big, uh, it's basically named after Rube Goldberg, the cartoonist, uh, pre-war cartoonist of uh, incredibly complicated and funny devices. And uh, it's in the National Cartoonist Society. The, the Ruben is the big enchilada, is it not? It's the, yeah, it's, it's the equivalent it's of, yeah. Cartoonist of the year. Right. In other words, we, we got we've gotten into a shorthand of calling all of them Rubin Awards, even though like th there's divisional awards and then there's the Rubin Award. And technically, I found this somewhere. 
they, they've they tried to, speaking of how we influence words and language, they're trying to rename the division awards as Silver Rubens. And right. then the best cartoonist of the year is the Ruben Award. So I was just curious. Now, listen, I always get a little uncomfortable when making lists like this and talking about people because I always feel bad I'm going to leave somebody off the list. But if we keep ourselves to maybe five people, all right, or or in other words, just if we will, this is not a comprehensive list. This There's more people on my list than this, uh, and then we're going to talk. But if I were to ask you, Dave, how, uh, who made your list, or or not necessarily who which names you wrote down, but uh, who you think did the best cartooning work in 2023, would you uh, be comfortable giving me an answer? I would. I would. I. You know what? For the benefit of the younger cartoonists who might like to hear what the process is. So yeah. we are mailed a blank ballot that has seven lines and you're supposed to nominate not a lifetime achievement award, like not Brad's done 25 years worth of great comics. What I'm, right. what we're nominating is who did the best overall, biggest, influential, uh, most successfully done comics in 2023, right? Uh, just that year, who's yeah. sort of the cartoonist of the year. Um, and then you mail off your seven names to an accounting firm and they tally it up. And whoever you nominate for number one gets, I think, seven points. Is that how it works, Brad? Seven and number points. two gets yep. six points. Seven yeah. Points. Yep. And so your seventh nominee gets one point. Anyway, that's the process. And it's fun because it's it's super anonymous. It's done by an accounting firm. It makes me feel good about that. Uh, so as far as who I would nominate. There's a lot of uh, lifetime achievement type cartoonists that I would love to see get the award. But in yeah. 2023, they didn't do any work per se. I would love, love, love Jeff Smith for Bone to get the yeah. Rubin Award sometime. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there was nothing done in 2023. I can't do that. I would love Raina Telgemeier to be nominated. Yeah. I think, frankly, no one has done more for getting comics in front of kids than Reina in the last decade. Although uh, Dog Man is a good argument for Dave Pilkey getting that nod mm -hmm. too. But uh, Reina and, and, and Dave together, uh, in incredibly influential for a whole generation of kids in comics. But as far as 2023, um, with the idea that the Rubin has historically been more towards comic strip folks, because it comes out of the National Cartoonist Society, yeah. uh, I think my pick of picks would be Sarah Anderson of Sarah Scribbles, who yep. I think is just a hit after hit maker with yeah. her comics. She's so darn good. And it is so hard to write and to draw um, with clarity and simplicity. And boy, does she do it week after week, day after day. Yep. I'm just going to I'm just going to check that one off my list. I had her name uh, on there as well. Uh, consistent, uh, really, really good at the craft. And uh, and and also somebody there's no there's nobody out there who you're going to say, oh, that's just like Sarah Anderson, but maybe a little bit more so. Right. She's got such a unique voice yes. in, in, that you can't. Yeah. She's impossible to imitate. Uh, you, you, you might be able to get the drawing down, but you're never going to get the voice down. And uh, to be able to achieve that at this stage in her career is is jaw dropping. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, too, and I think actually you had made this point in an earlier discussion we were having offline about this, which is that uh, if you think of the cartoonist of the year as someone who also sort of promotes the art form or at least lifts up the best aspects yeah. of what the art form should be. I mean, we can't fail to mention the fact that Sarah is fighting the good fight in in the courts about AI. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. She's uh, in the forefront of that, putting her money where her mouth is, by the way, because uh, that that legal battle can't be cheap and fighting over when AI uses your work. Who owns the copyright and and how should that be determined to have her get the award this year as recognition of the important work and that the good work she's done in comics and the important work she's doing out there on behalf of all of us to get a to, to solidify that legal definition, mm -hmm. I think would be really, really worthwhile. So, yeah, I, I yeah. co-sign that 100 percent. 
Yeah. Now, are we going to move down the list and 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 sort? Of, we don't need to give all seven, but are we going to give our top picks? No, for no. I just we... I've got a few. I've got a few who I think are are really worth mentioning. And again, if if you don't if if you don't hear your name li- listed, <laughs> it's just because it's just because I listed five and you probably made it number six. Okay? Yes, you were right. But, you were right so, there. It was just a, it was an angel's whisker as to how yes, close you were yes, being number six. We, yeah. And, and, Maybe even we'll blame Matt. Matt must have cut a few. That's what we'll oh. do. We'll blame oh, our editor. Oh, that's what we'll do. We'll throw we'll, Matt, our editor, under the bus, yeah, and we'll say this that Matt, is all yeah. Matt's fault if your name didn't get read. Uh, but one name that I, I that that okay, so I I went to the NCS uh, uh, weekend last week or last year, and they had that nice little goodie bag. Remember the goodie bag? And they had some books in there, and one of those books uh, made me remember how much I really, really do treasure uh, Dana Simpson, who I think is doing top tier work. She's somebody yeah. that's probably closer to 80 20, but on the other side, 80% is good stuff, 20% <laughs> maybe isn't. Uh, uh, Phoebe and her, I've, I've always, always since the early days of web comics, I have respected her and her ability uh, as a cartoonist. And uh, I think her work uh, this past year has been some of the best uh, comic strip making I've seen in a long, long time. Uh, I, I, I think, I think she's a top tier talent. I, you know, I gotta say, uh, A, I agree. B, in terms of what you, it's it's good to judge a comic based on what it's trying to achieve and who the audience that it's for and and who it's yeah. bringing in and how it's hitting or not hitting the tone that it's trying to achieve and mm-hmm. Phoebe and her unicorn day in and day out uh nails what it's trying to do in terms of yes. the tone in terms of the audience in terms of the execution both Dana's line art and Dana's writing are are top notch. Yeah, I I can't argue with that one. That's a great. That's a really great choice. Yeah. I, I I will jump in with one of mine uh, too on that line. Is that as far as people that are just absolutely nailing the art of the comic strip, um, Tahid Bondia uh, with Crabgrass. Yes. And I, I think we've had Tahid on the show before. And holy hell! In terms of both the quality of the line and the quality of the writing. And the mm-hmm. overall mood and the both the joy and the humanity that that uh, he writes for, uh, that is just a top notch comic strip. Yep. Uh, don't you think? Very good writing. Excellent gag writing. Beautiful art. Uh, somebody who very much conjures a Bill Watterson esque uh, aura when you read uh, Tahid's stuff. Uh, absolutely. But also uniquely his own, too, don't you think? Yes, yes. But I, yeah, but but it, the stuff just sparkles. It, it, it like yeah. when you see it, uh, and and it's uh, in a in a, either on a newspaper comics page or if it's online, and, and you see it among the other things in your feed, it jumps out. There, there there's nothing that's that 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 that, that co- compares to it. It 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 it's so unique. It's so uh, solidly presented that mm-hmm, it's it's mm-hmm. it, it's it's just one of those things that it's kind of a no brainer. That 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 that's one of the names that should be at least in consideration for an award like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will jump a little further afield, actually, for this for this next one of mine that I would throw out, which is granted the the NCS and the Ruben traditionally have sort of a rooting in comic strips, but yeah. I would actually propose a New Yorker cartoonist should be in the list for 2023, and that's uh, Asher Perlman. If you're familiar with oh, Asher, uh, Brad, yes. Yes, who, uh, who I have never met, uh, but I have to tell you, as far as pure strength of writing and also the goofiness of the drawings, but pure strength mm-hmm. of writing, that mf is the funniest. I mean, joke after joke after joke. I'm like, God, that's yes. well presented. God, that's incredibly inventive and, and original. And uh, I, again, with the 80-20 rule, it's like 80-20, but in the other direction. Like 20%, I'll be like, yeah, that was okay. 80%, yeah. I'm like, damn it, damn it. Why didn't I think of that? Damn it, that's so good. And it's so yes. hard to do in a single pan New Yorker format. And also, over time, create a world and a tone of what an Asher Perlman New Yorker comic is that yes. I think Asher's doing amazing work. So when I first discovered James Thurber, uh, I, I, yes. I had a hard time processing what I was seeing and, and somebody said that James Thurber does the kind of comics that only he could do they're, 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 the ideas yes. necessarily yeah. are, are there, but, but the way they are processed through James Thurber's lens makes it special. Right. And I think about right. that when I see Asher Perlman stuff, 
I'll, I'll give you a great example. Here's an idea that you or I, Dave, could have easily come up with, although we didn't. We, uh, but if we would have drawn it, it wouldn't have been <laughs> half as good. And and here's here's right, the one that I was right. thinking. Here's the one that I was thinking about. Uh, two women are in a bar. They're in the foreground, and they're looking over the shoulders at this man that's sitting at the bar, right? And the man at the bar is wearing diapers. And the caption from one of the women talking to the other woman in the foreground says, I think I can change him. <laughs> now, that joke, <sighs> either one of us could have done would not have been half as funny. But through Asher Perlman's no. lens, that very, you know what I always say? It's not the idea. It's the execution of the idea. His execution yes. is just absolutely Perfect and, and, and fits the New Yorker uh, theme very, very well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, what, so who else you got on your list, Brad? I, if we're going single panel, you know what? I think it's time to put Dave Blazik's name up there. He is. Uh, oh, he really? has been, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I listen. Not only uh, it, uh, having having met the guy, I just think he's a, a sweet guy. But also, let's not forget you and I agree on one thing. And that is that single panel is one of the hardest things to write. Here's a guy that has been nominated and won the division award for uh, single panel. Uh, what, four or five times? He's just got nominated again. Yeah. He's got a bunch of wins under his belt. Uh, when you're that consistent over time, uh, that, that, that you've got that many uh, nominations and a bunch of uh, awards uh, for that division in one of the hardest things to do. I think it's time that you consider the guy for the top prize. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great pitch. I, um, for my other ones, the, the, I, so this is where they start to get a little further afield, but uh, I will say um, uh, Darren Bell, who's been producing consistently oh, great work. Yes. I think he actually won a Pulitzer Prize. But in 2023, I, I just want to say I'm proud of him because it's so hard to, um, much in the same way we we were proud of Scott Kurtz for trying on the graphic novel and trying on a completely different uh, uh, yeah. uh, feel and look um, for their work. Darren doing the talk in 2023 was such a big uh, project and a new venue, new outlet, new style of of writing for the graphic novel, and I think it really landed uh, wonderfully. So that might be uh, an option for me for 2023 as yeah. well. How about who else? Who else you got on the list there? I'd love to see Jonathan and Elizabeth from War and Peace to get that nod. Their work oh, has yeah. not as only... far, yeah, as far as up and coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Great work. Consistent work. And also, as we had him on the show, one of the most unique collaborations in comics in that they both share the writing duties and they both share the art duties. In other words, one of them might draw right. Monday's comic. The other one might draw Thursday's comic and you and you never know who's drawing it and you never it's it's a it's a collaboration in the truest sense of the word. And I think that's super unique. Uh, and also, uh, you know, they're international and I'd like to see an international mm -hmm. uh, nomination up there, so, you know, because it's been very America focused, America centric. And mm -hmm. I'd like to see mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, hell, I'd like to see them join the NCS. Uh, and and this might be a good oh, way to, to to have them consider it. You know, but yeah, I think I think their work has been absolutely stellar. Well, as far as international, I will I will make an admission here, which is that if we're if we're making it a little broader in terms of international cartoonists, there's probably Brad about ten manga cartoonists. Yeah. That, that should absolutely be put up for cartoonists of the year that that unfortunately probably won't just because for cultural reasons, it mostly Americans voting for Americans. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you're right. In the same way that Warren Peas are pr producing banger after banger. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of manga that's just blowing the world away with quality that in 2023 probably should be up for the Rubin, you know? Oh, yeah. And if you're going to open it up to uh, open it up like that, then you got to bring in a few of your favorites from the comic book community, right? They, I, I'm going to throw Amanda Connor in there any oh, day yeah. of the week when you're talking about uh, uh, that that kind of genre of comics, that superhero comic thing. You you got to put her on the list. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, for the comic book world, I have two divergent answers, which is not very satisfactory because car, you know, cartoonist of the year 
implies writing and drawing and doing all the stuff. Uh, I think uh, Tom King writing wise is continuing to just hit after hit in terms of really interesting storytelling mm -hmm. in the comic book world. But that's not necessarily cartoonist of the year. That's writer right. of the year. That's, but that's not satisfactory in the same way that like Fiona Staples uh, continues to put out some of the most beautiful work in the world. But it's not cartoonist of the year. It's artist of the year in, in right. Fiona's case. So I don't really have a satisfying answer for cartoonist of the year who would be basically writing, drawing and producing their own comic book by themselves. I can't think of a graphic novel that I would or graphic novels I would, but not necessarily yeah. in the superhero world that would that would meet that condition. Yeah, no, it's 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 hard. It's hard to do. And and what I found myself uh, struggling with is that I had a hard time limiting it to seven because there are so many people doing really good work right now uh, online and 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 obviously in print. Because uh, you got to throw in like <clears throat> I'd love to put Scott in there. Scott's book hasn't hadn't come out in 2023, so uh, Scott Kurtz probably going to be in the nominations for uh, the work done in 2024. But also take a look at people like Mark Tatuli, Keith Knight, uh, tons and tons of people out there who are doing really really good kind of genre defining work that yeah. uh, in their own spheres, that that is not only good work, but again, I, I'd like to see uh, Keith does a lot of activism in his work. I'd like to see that recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just so, and also not for nothing. Uh, somebody who is uh, I, I got to say uh, this is this is one that I didn't mention but is absolutely was at the top of my list. And that's a guy that not only does deft work with humor, but does amazing sci-fi work as well. And that's a guy named Dave Kellett. I think that absolutely. <laughs> I'm not immune. I'm not immune to a little praise. Oh, but uh, that's very nice of you. No, I no, think I, you. I, honestly, I think you did good work this year. I I want to return the favor and say I also thought Dave Kellett did great work. So th thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I mean, listen, as far as friendship goes, you're at the top of your game in terms of both your writing and your line art and your and your execution. And it's actually fun to see you at this stage of your cartooning, knowing you from, I guess, 99, maybe 2000 uh, yeah. and seeing uh, what an amazing cartoonist uh, you have become from already amazing footing. It's been fun to see. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I throw that right back at you in all honesty, because you're producing probably the best work of your career, I would say, this past year. I am. I am pretty happy. I, I and, and but of course, then going back to our first topic it, five years from now, I'll look back at that and say, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I also did say this in humility, as good as I feel about the art that I'm producing. And trust me, I'm feeling really good about especially drive mm -hmm. the, uh, as far as how it's going. Uh I'm humble enough and life has given me enough perspective where I can look at other people's stuff and go, nah, they're producing better stuff. You know, like yeah. Sarah Anderson is unquestionably hitting it out of the park more than mm -hmm. I'm hitting it out of the park with drive like that. Sarah's just doing better work. And that's that's a good place to be in terms of uh, age gives you a little humility that maybe you didn't have in your 20s and 30s, you yeah. know, where in the 20s and 30s. Listen, uh, to be honest, I was looking for. What's the word? Validation, justification, uh, validation yes. is the word where I was like, I'm as good as they are. I, I should be I should be getting Ruben nominations. I should be getting Eisner nominations. Now I'm like, no, you know what? They're doing great work and I don't need that to me, as is always the case. And we should remind people of this. Brad and I have talked about this before. We've both won awards. We've both been nominated for awards. Yeah. The true reward in comics is getting to do another year of comics. And I, right. I that is the one that I am so proud of is the fact that I've continuously and Brad as well, year in and year out, have produced a career for ourselves that allow us to keep going. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I've said it before, I, I don't consider myself the greatest cartoonist, but I like to think that I punch above my weight in terms of, yeah. of, of my abilities as a cartoonist. And that's given me a career which allows me to have another year in cartooning. Well, Dave, let's see if we can sneak one more question from our Patreon backers in here. This one comes in. Uh, from uh, patreon.com slash comic lab. And this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, 
It's a real interesting process and a, uh, and a great question. Question is, is it worth going back to redraw my pages in traditional ink for sales as originals? I already do the, pay, pay, uh, the pencils on one side of an 11 by 17 copy paper and again on the other side with a light box to tighten it up and fix any wonky faces. And that's how this person is using the flip right? That we talked about oh, flip it to see your mistakes. Yeah, yeah. They're drawing it on one side of, of thin paper, flipping it over, redrawing it to fix, uh, you know, things that aren't quite right. Then they'll scan that side in, flip it back so that they've got the right orientation and do, uh, and then they'll ink it from there. Right now, or this person in. says yeah, yeah, yeah. I do the, the inks for my covers on comic paper uh, but they never transfer this for the interiors, just the co uh, just for the covers. Mm -hmm. The original art for my first cover sold for a really healthy amount, all things considered. It got me considering doing the interiors. The drawback is less time on more current or future projects. So the only part that they're leaving out here, Dave, it, that they didn't say explicitly that is going to would help this conversation right on the interior pages, we're left to assume that the final art is being done digitally, although it's not said outright. But I can't imagine they're scanning in pencils, right? So they've got to be finishing that art digitally for the interiors. No, I, well, I took it, to, I took that initial part of the process, but yeah, I don't disagree with you generally, but I took the initial part of the copy paper to be the or the interior pages, right? Yeah, that's where it, it gets confusing. They're doing the, the pencils on copy paper. Right. Then they scan that in. Now, they didn't tell us what they did after that, but we're left to assume that for the final art, they take that and digitally render it. Right. OK. Yeah, I think most of the heavy lifting would have been done line art wise because they said they inked it. So they might be cleaning it up. They're definitely flipping it uh, and they right. might be modifying it in Photoshop. But I, I think you and I could agree that that is mostly inked and done as line art. If it's if it's <laughs> that's the, well, let's let's answer the question. Let's agree both to ways. disagree on that. One. OK, yeah, because I, I can't imagine they're doing that. But but here's here's what we've got one way or the other. We've got a situation where they don't have actual original art to sell, right? But they want to either redraw it uh, and re-ink it, or they want to do something along those lines so they have original art, quote unquote, original art to sell online because they had a really nice sale of their cover art. How do how do we what what advice do you have for this person in that regard? Right. How do we square this circle in terms of being able to have original yeah. art to sell? So I will say this: it is it, those pages better sell for a huge amount of money to warrant you drawing it for now a third time yeah. on better paper. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a way that looks like original art, question mark. Uh, like it's going to have to, you're going to be trying to match the style, which means you're going to be light boxing it, I guess, uh, which raises the question that why wouldn't you just do it on nicer paper to begin with? I suppose, you know, like that, right, if you right. can light box it in a way, why wouldn't you just do it that way to begin with? Um, and so, and I guess the answer is because you need the thinness in order to draw through it. Maybe that's the case. I, I don't know. Right. Um, I will say though, just as a side note, there's incredibly strong led light boxes that are so much more powerful than the ones 10 years ago. So maybe yeah. look into that. I, I don't know that it's worth it to redraw a page just to be able to sell it financially. Yeah. That to me does not seem worthwhile, especially because you don't know which ones are going to sell. So you're yes. now drawing your whole archives again, which, uh, which again feels like retreading, which Brad and I have also said is not worth your time. It's not um, yeah. both emotionally and artistically. It's not worth it to retread, but also like you don't know if they're going to sell at all or which ones are going to sell. So financially it feels like a bad move. Yeah. So it's a cost benefit analysis yes. thing. Yes. For what you're saying is that you got to look at the amount of time you're putting in and then ask yourself if you're going to get the benefit out of it. I would I would agree with that. No matter which way it breaks out in, in terms of uh, how this person is working, what we know for sure is that 
uh, you know, that they're redrawing to a certain extent. Right. And so Dave's going to bring up the uh, the economic problem with that, that that you're, you know, spending a lot of time. And obviously your your cover is going to sell well in the original art. But interior pages, mm, that's a big question mark, right? That that's another thing that that cover is a is a standing piece of art that, that I can see somebody wanting an interior page. Now, that's a smaller section of your audience that might want to own that. But I'll, I'll, let's leave the economic uh, situation be, behind because I'm going to bring up the ethical question of what you're doing oh, and that is this yeah 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 original art means something and as somebody that spends just about every morning on eBay looking through the original art, because I want to see if maybe there's something there that I like. Do you really? Uh, oh, wait, I didn't know that I about do. you. Really? I do. eBay has my number now. They send me an email every morning. And and I do. I look through the, the art because I really have gotten to enjoy collecting original art. Yeah. So and, and I've got a little bit of money from my birthday. And so now I've got couple hundred sitting in my pocket like burning a hole since april and I, I i'm looking for something that i would really enjoy to spend it on well what would be a title or an artist that you'd be like oh they've got my money if it, it was the right piece oh. came along oh that that that's so fun okay so there's there's one guy and i've got he did a comic strip that was very much like courting disaster in that it was about sex and relationships and so forth uh, 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 it was a newspaper comic strip and it did full nudity. <laughs> and by the way, the guy can draw his ass off. It is so good. Uh, it, 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 it and I oh, hold on. I'm going to see if I can find it. We can we can That's edit okay. this part out. I mean, uh, how, how appropriate that he could draw his ass off if he was doing enough fully <laughs> nude uh, comics. So that's great. <laughs> oh, he's so good. He's such a drafts person. I love it so much. Uh, uh, I, I, I may not be able to find it, but he's number one on my list. Also, I don't know why uh, Wizard of Id is on that, that because the, <laughs> I, 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 did, I did not like that comic particularly, but I'd like to have, uh, because of the art, I'd really like to have one of those for my collection. And I don't know why I keep looking for Wizard of Id, but but here we are. I'm, I'm looking for But nothing for from Plastic Man? I would have thought Plastic Man would be the top of your uh, list. Like, like, a, like a Jack Cole original is, that is more uh, me being a realist in that I know uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that I couldn't afford Jack Cole art. I do have a Ramona. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, she died just recently. Uh, a Ramona Frendon. She was a Plastic Man artist, and I found uh, her uh, doing a Plastic Man illustration. Uh, just a small one. She must have done it at a comic convention, and I picked that up because it was in my price oh, range. So fun. I do how have uh, okay. a Ramona Fraden uh, that that is in my collection now. So that is one plastic man. I've got another plastic man that I, that actually a comic lab uh, backer uh, sent me uh, not too long ago that I've got here. So I do have that. I, like, there are some things that I, that I I would love to have in my collection, but I just know I can't afford them. Right? Like yeah, yeah, Walt yeah. Kelly. Totally I'd fun. love to have a Pogo. I can't afford that. That's going to price me yeah. out very very quickly. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, there's other people that are like that. I do have a Jim Davis. It's a U.S. Acres, but it's still a Jim Davis. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, <laughs> kind of. But but to, without taking us too far afield uh, and go, go into the weeds, uh, when I look at uh, in my eBay every morning and it says original art and I see people who are clearly posting uh, prints or things that I know just by looking at them aren't originals. Right. I get very upset because original art means something. It means that this was the art that was originally produced. It was the origin mm -hmm. of the comic that you saw later on on the web right. or in print or in a book or in the newspaper. It's the origin of all of that. To take something after you've com completed it and then to do the original art or the, you know, the, the, it's original because you created it, but it isn't original in the sense of a collector would think. Right. So uh, it's art, but it's not original art. Yes. Yes. It's hand drawn, but it's not originally drawn. And 
I don't like, I think there's an ethical problem with that. Saying that, for, I, I've done it once, but I did it for a Patreon backer who knew what they were getting into. And I, I, I because he really liked this comic and he, he wanted to hire me to do uh, an ink drawing of it. I said, I'll do that as long as you and I are on the same page. It's not the original art. I'm doing it as an art piece. It's a standalone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, but, but for, to do that on the regular and to put those out and and create that kind of confusion just for me. And I'm not saying that for our question asker that they're being unethical, but for me, that's an ethical line that I personally would feel uncomfortable crossing. Agreed. And I too have also done it once over 25 years in my career. Yeah. And for similar circumstances, I had someone buy one it legitimately got lost in the mail. It never turned up. And so she said, well, would you redraw it? And I said, yes, and I can do it very close to yes. the original art. I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm good enough that I can make it look really close. In fact, damn near yeah. uh, uh, identical. But it's not the original art. And as long as you're OK with that. And she's like, oh, yeah, I just like the joke. And I just really want that specific comic. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. Yeah. But uh, there is sort of an ethical line there. And you're right in that the set, because you're not far at that point from just becoming Andy Warhol and being able right. to say, Hey, I'll do 48 versions of this original. If anybody wants them, I'll do, I'll redraw it 48 times. Uh, yeah. because basically what you're doing is you're saying, Hey, the money's good enough. I'll redraw it. And so what's stopping you from doing that twice or three times or 50 right. times, you know, like there's it, uh, granted, that's a, a different question, but in general, I will agree with Brad that it's a slippery slope. In fact, it's not a slippery slope. It is an ethical uh, conundrum to say, hey, you're buying the original art. You're not really buying the original art. You're buying art right. and you're buying art by the same person that produced that original art. But this is not the original art. And then there's the question of this. Is that person and, and, I, and in, our, in the cases that you and I lined up, I, I wouldn't expect that this would, would happen. Right. Uh, but in, in, in a larger sense. Is that person who gets that going to turn around and try to increase the value if they sell it by claiming that it's an original? Right. Yeah. No, you're not you wrong. See what like, I'm saying? You have you have started a potential cascading series of frauds. You know what I mean? In terms of right. over the life of that comic. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, would I do this? No. Would I recommend my recommendation is if you want original art. Tinker with your process such that you are producing original art. It is not impossible. Yes. Uh, I would suggest maybe drawing di pencils digitally and then lightboxing and then mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, having the inked uh, paper that you can then scan back in or penciling on the actual thing. And you can ink right over pencils. I did that for probably 15 years. And then with a high quality paper and a high quality eraser, you can erase those pencils off or leave them on. Some people love pencils. I kind of like my now. That's one thing that you and I disagree on. I like seeing the pencils as part of the original. I think that's part of the process. Yeah, I I can't <laughs> disagree with you in an artistic sense. Like I think you also use non photo blue too, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. So I use uh, graphite, and the problem is the the standard sort of lead quote unquote pencil. Uh, it scans along with ink, whereas Brad can tinker with his settings for non photo blue and have it not scan, and so. For me, right. I get rid of the pencils. Uh, I, in fact, I don't even use pencils anymore. I got rid of the pencils because it just it sh smudges the art a little bit you know, <laughs> around the edges. Oh, I finally found his name. Joseph Gaul. <laughs> Who is this? J-O-S-E-P. And then his last name was G-U-A-L. Joseph Gual. And he had a comic called George and Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E. 2010, so not that long ago, and had it, this was this looks like it was drawn in the same style as like Modesty Blaze or Apartment 3G, uh, super super crisp, beautiful line art had full nudity, what? <laughs> and a bunch of the jokes were like sex jokes. <laughs> and this appeared and it's where? It's just so beautiful. It, what's that? Disappeared where? I, I honestly don't know. It appeared on my, okay, hold on. I was going to say it appeared on eBay, but here we go. <laughs> it appeared here's, on eBay. Here's the, uh, George and Lynn is a UK strip about a suburban married couple who enjoy an easy life of socializing, vacation, dinners out, and sex. 
<laughs> so wait a minute. This is perfect because, Dave, this all comes together. Do you remember not too long ago, people uh, uh, asked us who our favorite comics from outside of the United States was? And we listed a whole bunch and we didn't list anybody from the UK. Yeah, we didn't. And <laughs> somebody online somebody online was very upset that we didn't list anybody from Britain. Well, guess what? Guess what? Joseph Guau. <laughs> that's my that's my British guy. Uh, a newspaper cartoonist in the UK is absolutely now on a, on my list of some of my favorite comics. And he's from Britain. So, boom. There you go. That. So between the two of us, we have one cartoonist in the UK that's among <gasps> no, our I'm favorites. No, I'm telling you, Dave. You see this guy's work, honest to goodness, and once you get done blushing, you're gonna fall in once love. Once I get done blushing, this, <laughs> this guy is—he's all. If I, I, oh, if I could draw like this guy, he really solid stuff. I just awesome. I'm gonna send you some. I'm gonna send you some of the uh, PG ones because not every day was out there frolicking nude, but. Uh, I'm going to show you some of his art. You're going to see what I'm talking about. This guy was top tier talent. It's just funny. It speaks to how different the newspaper experience was between the U S and the UK yes. that you had just comic strip nudity. Like, Hey, no big deal. We're just over here going to town, you know, uh, yeah, I don't meanwhile, think on the were... other side of the Atlantic, we had, uh, we had Hagger the horrible being like, Oh, I shaved my beard today. Scandalous. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Nobody wanted to see Hagar. Naked, but... <laughs> They weren't, but by the way, they weren't, they weren't going to town. It's just that sometimes when this married couple had a conversation, she happened to be in the bathtub a lot. Yeah, I bet it was always her. Wasn't that always the case? With oh, no, he was not, I don't think this guy's taken a bath in the last 24 it's years, never, but, but she yeah, was always in constantly. the bathtub. But nobody, yeah. nobody ever draws the dude hanging brain in the background of the comic. No. It's always the girl in the tub because it's, it's, it's always anyway, it's very male gazy. But anyway, Brad, uh, I will. I, will, I look well, forward listen, to whatever listen. it is you're about to send me. I, no, I'm sending you a bunch and you're going to love them. But, <laughs> but but the only way I can send you all this stuff if, is if we turn these microphones off and bring this show to a close. So I'm going to say that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my pal, Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Link at evilcomic.com. And my close personal friend, Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by the ever-wonderful Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. And if you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much for those Spotify reviews. You are keeping us right at the top of that search, and we appreciate it. And if you give us a nice review on uh, Apple Podcasts, you may hear your review featured on future episodes like this one. Dave, this did not come in through... This is not coming through Apple Podcasts. This came in through a conversation on Instagram. And uh, the person, I got permission to tell this story. <laughs> but wait till you hear this. Uh, he says, I'm sure I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I owe everything I have to the encouragement I got from Web Comics Weekly. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I was on probation and facing the possibility of going to prison for a year because of graffiti charges if I was charged with anything else. And I didn't know what to do with myself until I found the Web Comics Weekly podcast. And oh, we wow. took this person, <laughs> listen to the show, uh, I guess, I, I, I he was like, oh, I'll do, and by the way, if you see the comics this guy is doing, Here's another one that that should be in consideration uh, for a Rubin Award. Does top tier stuff, and uh, <laughs> from the sounds of it, we saved him from prison. Well, that that's fantastic. Web Comics Weekly, our old podcast that we used to do with Chris Straub and and uh, and Scott Kurtz, and how delightful that that. Uh, I hope that they, are they still listening to Comic Lab or have they? They said they are, it. they are a Comic Lab Patreon backer. Uh, I can tell. I won't. I won't say anything else because I don't want to necessarily, you know, uh, uh, tell more than that. Uh, give any, any, you know, identifying information. Right. But yes, yes, a, an active uh, uh, com part of the comics community. Fantastic. That is that is fantastic. Thank you for the kind words. I'm so glad to hear that the podcasts 
have helped you uh, in in that moment and actually got you onto the path to comics. That's fantastic. Yeah. So on that note, I will say Comic Lab is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So I will go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash it was never pronounced Cincinnati. <laughs> I was wondering whether you're going to bring that back. <laughs> this is why you are the best. So now that we know the origin of your mispronunciation of Cincinnati, I find it hilarious that there was a uh, a 25 year old Brad Geiger living in Ohio, heard some sportscaster once say Cincinnati, <laughs> and then to himself goes, "Well, time for me to smugly correct everyone on the correct pronunciation of Cincinnati for the rest of my life." The smug part is accurate. The rest of it, not so much. But the smug part, you got me on. <laughs>